This video introduces a new tool. It's called a risk matrix. And this is a tool with 13 objective questions that helps to provide a clearer picture of how risky new products are relative to their potential for profit. Again, the name of this tool is the risk matrix tool. So this tool helps us to estimate the probability of success based upon how big a stretch it is for the new product for the firm. And another way of looking at this is what is the probability of risk? So we're using success, we're using risk. And so what do we find? We find that the less familiar the intended market and the intended product are, the higher the risk is for the company. We're gonna see a graph that is based on product technology as well as intended market innovation. And <clears throat> how are we gonna use this tool? We're gonna to answer specific questions that will allow us to plot a dot on the graph along an x-axis and a y-axis. So looking at just a typical graph, but this graph is going to be what? This matrix is going to be what? It is going to help us to view our risk from what? From closeness. How close is the new product to our existing market? How close is the new product or the technology to our existing product suite? So one is how close is the market? The other one is how close is the product or technology market being the x-axis, product or technology being the y-axis. And so what we see is that familiar products that are similar to our current markets are going to fall in the bottom left-hand portion of our matrix, which does what? It reflects a lower degree of risk. And in this case, we're saying a lower degree or a lower probability of failure. For products that are not as familiar, those products are going to be where? They're going to fall in the upper right. So those products in the upper right corner of our graph represent a higher degree of risk and therefore a higher probability of failure. So here's what our graph looks like. We can see our probabilities of failure, our graph on the left. And so we see here looking at uh, product technology and as well intended market. So if the intended market is the same as our present market and our product and technology is the same as our current offerings, then what is the risk there? that risk or that probability of failure is very low. It's 25 to 40%. Next, as we move up our product technology, we see adjacent to current offerings. When we move across our intended market, we see adjacent to present. Now we're starting to see more and more risk here. So 40 to 50%. 45 to 60%. And then the farther we get out, the, it's something that's brand new to the company from a product standpoint or technology standpoint or from a market standpoint, the farther out we get, the greater the probability of failure, the greater the probability of risk. So here is a graph that shows dots that represent new products. And what we see is that the larger the dot, that reflects a greater profit potential. So we've got certain ones that have greater profit potential, but they have more risk, therefore a greater probability of failure. We have other ones that have um, uh, a much lower probability of failure, a much lower degree of risk. However, what do we notice about these ones as well that have a much lower 
degree of um, risk or probability of failure. They're also much lower in our potential for profit. And so that is one of the things that we need to look at when we look at this graph on the right. If you have limited resources, which ones of these new products that, that are represented by these dots, which ones of these new products would you want to focus on? Which products would you pursue? Why would you do that with regard to our risk and again, our potential for profit? And then while we're looking at these, we should not forget that what is one of the things that, that, that drains a company, according to the article, according to George Day that we've read, what is one of the things that drains a company it's, it's that constant demand on R&D, research and development, for what? For those incremental changes to our product. So increasing the, the service, if you will, of that product, but they're actually incremental. They're small changes. And what do those small changes do? They're taking up a lot of money. And what are we getting in return for those? Well, we're not getting as much. Whereas these two right here, the one I would probably focus on is this one right here. So it, it is a little bit riskier in that it is adjacent to our intended market. It is adjacent to our current offerings, but look how much profit we've got. I would not look at this one. I would look at this one right here because that one has a much lower risk and a much, much greater potential for profit. These ones down here, again, yes, but what is our potential for profit that we would get out of making those incremental changes to our products? And you're saying, well, how do you plot these actual points? We're gonna plot these points by asking questions. So we've got six questions there. And so this intended market, the x-axis, looks at how well do we understand the market? How well do we understand our customers? How, under, how well do we understand their preferences for our products? Are our sales, delivery, service capabilities to execute these products, do we have that potential? And how well do we know our competitors? As well, so that is looking at this first portion here. What are those questions? These three questions are, what is the customer's behavior and decision-making process? That will be what? So here are our answers to the questions. Will those customers' behavior, customer behaviors and decision-making processes be the same as in our present market? Will they partially overlap with our present market or will they be entirely different from our present market? And so we have numbers here, one, two, three, four, five. And again, the farther away that we get, the more unfamiliar our intended market is from our current market, the higher the value. And therefore that is going to be the greater the numeric value for our x-axis for our graph. What are our other questions there is our distribution and sales activities will be the same, will partially overlap, or will be entirely different. The competitive set for our, our products are what? Are those going to be the same partially overlap or are they going to be entirely different when we look at do our customers give us permission to create these these products our we talk about these three questions our brand promise is our brand promise highly relevant 
somewhat relevant or not at all relevant? So are we looking, are our customers looking at us for our particular brand as well? Our customer relationships are what? Highly relevant, our existing current customer relationships, somewhat relevant or not at all relevant. Our knowledge of our competitors' behaviors and intentions, how well do we know or do we expect what our competitors will do as a result of us creating this new product? So what do we do? We add these up, we get a total, that is our x-axis, and then our y-axis. So our y-axis has seven questions. What are those seven questions? So our seven, our first question here is our current development capability. So we're looking at what? What is our technology there? Our current development capability is fully applicable to this new product or it will require significant adaptation or is not applicable at all, which would be a five. Our, techno our technology competency. So how well do we um, innovate from a technical standpoint? How well are we able to manufacture? How well are we able to uh, take this to market is, is that capability fully applicable for this particular product or is it a completely different type of product or will it require significant adaptation is it not applicable at all what about our intellectual property protection what about our manufacturing and service delivery system so this is how prepared our company is to do what to develop this new product and then after that, we look at, at, at these three questions, the required knowledge and science bases of our company are what? Are identical to those of our current offerings or overlap somewhat with our current offerings or are completely different. So our knowledge and science of the particular product is the, the, this new product, is it close? Um, is it exactly the same or identical? Is it close or not close at all? Is the necessary product and service functions, are those close? Are they somewhat close or not at all close? Or our expected quality standards, where do we lie there? So this is our build capability. Do we, can we build this in-house or will we need to purchase those capabilities, those resource capabilities outside. So this will be our, our total for our y-axis. So going back to where we were, our original graph, these questions for our x-axis, these questions for our y-axis, how far is it placing us? So those higher numbers are placing us farther and farther out, which are going to do what? Are going to tell us that we've got a greater degree of failure, or pardon me, a, a greater probability of, of failure because we have a greater degree of risk. But what these questions do not ask is how close it tells us about our failure but we need to as well look at the size of the dot. What is that, what is that potential for revenue? What is our fine line again between revenue and risk? Do we want to spend all of our money, all of our time, all of our resources for only incremental changes, or do we want to have that big eye for the innovation rather than the little eye for innovation? Do we want to have that big eye for innovation and define something like this? Does it mean that we will <coughs> succeed? No, none of this is set in stone. These are probabilities. These are relativities. Where are we with relative risk and relative potential for revenue.
So again, this particular risk matrix tool is another attempt at adding some science to the art of strategy.